Brother Jeff alluded to this this morning. I thought I'd elaborate just a little more on it in our rearranging of schedules on the preaching. Jeff begins a gospel meeting at Bellevue at the end of the month, and thus that Sunday, the last Sunday of the month, we have our meal. He won't be here. And then returning, uh, I'll be gone. This was a rather quick <laughs> uh, decision because uh, Johnny Oxendine, who heads up things now with the um, English lectures, had someone drop out on him and call last week. And frankly, I wasn't planning on anything along that line. But things were already lined up and things were already done and money was laid out. And so I agreed to go. So we're leaving on the 3rd of October and be gone until the 17th. And so Jeff will be preaching then, and hopefully it won't be too big a burden on him. But then at the end of the month of October, I'll begin a gospel meeting at Fish Hatchery Road, so uh, Jeff will do the honors then too. So anyway, I'm glad to be working with somebody like Jeff. I don't know that um, having seen his growth and development, I can hope for anybody better as a brother in Christ and his knowledge and practice of the truth and his ability to teach it, to set out the word, and to live a consecrated life. I mean that humbly, and I certainly mean it respectfully. Now, I'd like to deal today with a topic that's good for any of us to ask ourselves at any period of life, and that is, who do we attempt to please? Who do we attempt to please? It might be interesting to do a poll and just talk to people with just that. Who do you attempt to please every day of your life? Don't know that I have the time to do that kind of thing, but it might fit well on YouTube to go around standing on the corner asking folks, who do you go about attempting to please? Well, I read Paul's writing to the church at Rome, remembering that the New Testament for the most part's written to those who are Christians. And I find Paul saying, We then that are strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak and not to please ourselves. Now to give this a full study, we would have to understand what he's talking about when he means the infirmities of the weak. Right now, we'll just mention it could be weak in faith, which means they might be weak in their knowledge of the Bible, seeing that faith comes by hearing the word of God could be weak in various ways, but that fits the context. But the key is here not to please ourselves. This world is running over with people seeking to please themselves and expecting everybody else to please them. Then notice as he goes on, let every one of us please his neighbor. And for what reason? For his good to edification, edification, spiritual building up. That lets us know a little better about the context of what he means by pleasing. And then he emphasizes this about our Lord and Savior. For even Christ pleased not himself. Again, that's Romans 15, 1 through 3. Now we could milk that for a lot more. But it gives us, if we think about it, a deep insight into what the core of Christianity is all about. An individual conduct and our attitude toward ourselves, our families, our spiritual family, the church, toward our neighbors, and a neighbor is anyone in need, anybody really. Selfishness stands in the path of true devotion. And there's a simple way to answer that. I've used it many times in this pulpit and many other places. Uh, I like things being done my way. Do you? Now, if you say you don't, repent. It goes along with the in being an individual. It goes along with being a single solitary person and the way that we're put together as human beings. There must be a way that God can challenge us that we would will ourselves to submit to His will, which is presented, of course, in His Word. The carnal man, now what does that mean? Does that mean a fornicator? Well, it does, but it covers far more than that. Carnal in the scriptures means somebody who lives for this world, who lives strictly for the flesh and the appetites of the flesh. The carnal man seeks to please himself. 
and everything. But to be a follower of Christ, the old selfish man of sin must be destroyed. Notice what Paul said to the church in Colossae along this line. Mortify, and mortify means put to death. You will to separate yourselves from what he's about to say. Mortify, therefore, the earth. What do you mean by the earth? Fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Now watch. Why is that important? For the which caused the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience. Colossians 3, 5, and 6. We understand what happens to people when they don't really follow what was being emphasized in Jeff's sermon this morning, and that is filling yourself with the Word of God because you're hungering and thirsting after righteousness. I like the idea that he said that you, so, you spend so much time with the Bible, devouring it as your necessary food, that when things come up, it just bubbles to the surface. I like that idea. I might use that, Jeff, myself. It just bubbles to the surface. Have you ever seen a spring? It has not been dug out, a natural spring of water. And you'll see real white sand, and you can see the water just bubble up through that sand. In other words, it just can't be contained. And that's the idea. It's absolutely essential that the old man's selfish nature must die. For if ye live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye through the Spirit do mortify, that is, put to death the deeds of the body, ye shall live. Romans 8, verse 13. So living to please self, the fleshly self, is spiritual suicide. If you will look at Jesus' life on earth, his ultimate service was to God. But in his service to God, he served other people. And that's the reason Paul could say, for even Christ pleased not himself. It wasn't a matter of me getting things done the way I want it, when I want it, etc. It's a matter of carrying out the Lord's will. I have often thought over the years, in fact, I've mentioned it uh, speaking with Joanne at times, there are so many things I would have never done if I hadn't chosen, number one, to be a Christian, but especially as a gospel preacher and all that the New Testament defines gospel preacher to mean and the life that you live. So many things I would have ever taken upon myself. Because there are a lot of things just by my nature, I just soon not do that. <laughs> I just soon not do that. But it goes along with serving Christ. It goes along with the disposition of heart saying, not my will, but thine be done. Next point is that Jesus Christ pleased not himself. We've said that already, but we'll develop it further from our text in Romans 15 and the latter part of verse 3. Christ pleased not himself. Well then, what does that mean? He renounced all selfishness. For what end? For what cause? For what purpose? The salvation of mankind. Let's not make it that general. My salvation. Your salvation. That's why he didn't do that. He stated, I seek not mine own will, but the will of the Father which sent me. And when you read Isaiah 53 and God's suffering servant forecasting the death of Christ and what it would accomplish, then you see that it was not a pleasing thing. It was not an easy thing that God asked him to do. And again he said, for I, came not, for I came down from heaven not to do mine own will, but the will of him that sent me. John 6, 38. Only this kind of self-sacrifice could lead him to accomplish that which God set before him. Thus we have the writer of Hebrews saying to Jewish Christians under great persecution and more to come who are actually entertaining, just simply the way to think of it is removing the New Testament system from their Bibles and going back under the law. He would point to Christ and say, though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered and being made perfect. 
he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that. And the key word here is obey him. You, you will not live for yourself and be obedient to Christ in all things. You have to deny yourself to be obedient to Christ in everything. So Jesus is the prime example to look to. Jesus willingly yielded to the death on the cross for us. When you look up at the passage we noticed earlier in Colossians 3, 5, and 6, where he says, Mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth. And he talks about uh, the matter in the next verse of Romans 8, 13. But if ye through the Spirit, through the Spirit do mortify, put to death the deeds of the body, ye shall live. Some people read that and they'll think, well, you know, there's really nothing for me to do. I admit I'm a free moral agent. I can choose to do or not do, or at least attempt to, whatever it may be. But what's being said there is that the Holy Spirit revealed the will of Christ. So if I am to put to death the things he says that are to be separated from me relative to my selfish desires in this fleshly body, it'll be through following the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, Ephesians 6, 17. That's how I put to death the desires and appetites that are peculiar to the flesh and to this present life that we live. And this is so important to understand that some people teach a doctrine about the work of the Spirit or even just simply in general the work of God concerning me putting to death is it's almost I step back and, and as you hear the denominational people say, well, just turn it over to God. That is the most nebulous comment I've ever heard. What in the world does that mean? Well, I just got a problem. I'll just turn it over to God. If you were to pursue that, and ask them, tell me specifically how God's Word says you turn anything over to God. I don't know what they would say. But I do know what they mean. Well, God's going to do it for me. But here are things that says, I must will to submit my will to the truth of God. You can know that you ought to assemble with the saints to worship God on the first day of the week and know everything that goes on in that worship. You can know that. You can intellectually grasp it from the study of the Bible. But you have to do it. Or it amounts to nothing. Same thing's true of daily Bible study and prayer and uh, visiting the widows and orphans. The idea of visit there in the Greek means to supply for them what orphans normally have parents supply to them. They don't have parents. A widows normally have a husband supply for them, but they don't. You have to simply do it. And that was emphasized this morning very well. So why do you study your Bible? How do you, how do you cease pleasing yourself? What is... Um, what is your life worth for the spiritual body of Christ in the proclamation of the gospel and the defense of the same? Interesting then to see that Paul says that Jesus made himself of no reputation and took on him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men and being found in fashion as a man. Now notice, here's the key. He humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Philippians 2, 7 through 8. Something he had to do. He had to be put through all of that. He had to passively not resist. He had to submit. And that's why you have Isaiah 53 as a lamb, dumb, silent, before his shearers openeth not his mouth. Christ had to do that. It wasn't a matter of saying, oh, I know all about it. We can talk about it. No, he had to undergo it. He had to let them drive nails in his hands and drive nails in his feet. He had to undergo all that they put him through before he ever got to the cross. He had to be there on that cross suffering. It's easy to talk about another thing to do it when it comes to answering the question, who am I trying to please? Because Christ's will was to serve others, then that enabled him to face the terrible rigors of a shameful death on Calvary's cross. 
all the time praying, not my will, but thine be done. If we miss this in understanding what we're to be doing in the church, we miss a lot. We, we don't think we have to sacrifice, give up what's very important to us and needful to us that we might do the will of God. So this was the, his purpose in coming to earth. Matthew 20, 28, even as a son of man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. So yes, Jesus and the process of being obedient to God and everything had to be a servant of mankind. Uh, yes, his primary concern was to do the will of the Father and please Him, but that was all a part of doing the will of the Father, pleasing Him, was his involvement as a servant and all that he did with other people. He went about doing good, and we have to say as the Bible defines good. Then the next point is the Holy Spirit the third person of the Godhead, please not himself. You'll remember that in speaking of the apostles and what they would be able to accomplish after the Lord was no longer with them, after his death, burial, resurrection, ascension to heaven, that Jesus met with them and John gives us the account of what he had to say to them about who's going to be with you to help you as I've been with you. Howbeit when he, he said to the apostles, the spirit of truth. And let me pause there and say spirit of truth means that's the central core and purpose of the work of the spirit was to reveal the truth of the gospel. So he's called the spirit of truth. Howbeit when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. Now notice how the Holy Spirit is not exalting himself. For he shall not speak of himself. But whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. But now notice this next one. And the Holy Spirit is as much God as Christ, as much God as the Father. But notice, he, the Holy Spirit, shall glorify me. For he shall receive of mine and show it unto thee. John 16, 13 through 14. So you'll notice that the Holy Spirit did not come to glorify himself or his office or his work to exalt his personality. He didn't come to do that. Now, folks, there's an insight here if we'll take it. You ever notice how many people today claiming great religious service exalt the Holy Spirit constantly? Do you have the Spirit? Do you this? Do you that? The Holy Spirit this, the Holy Spirit that. That begins to raise antenna on mine. If it was really the Holy Spirit, who would he be glorifying? Who would be spoken of? Who would be declared? Who would be exalted? Who would be magnified? It wouldn't be the Holy Spirit. It would be Jesus Christ. His work was to reveal the Christ, and he did it through the word, the instrument or sword that the Spirit has revealed, Ephesians 6, 17. Jesus promised, again concerning the work of the Holy Spirit with the apostles, but when the Comforter is come, whom I will send unto you from the Father, again, notice the emphasis of the Spirit's work, even the Spirit of truth, which proceedeth from the Father, now watch again, he shall testify of the Father, he shall testify of himself, no, the scripture says, he shall testify of me. It's interesting that the New Testament is the sword of the Spirit, but it's the New Testament of Jesus Christ. Again, John 15, 26. It pleased God to send the Holy Spirit to instruct man in the way of salvation. Very interesting that the apostles were the apostles of Christ. The ambassadors of the court of heaven to men. Now they're fallible men. So God enables them with that which is beyond mortal powers to be able to perform and accomplish what Jesus called them to do. Thus they had what we know as the baptismal measure of power that we see them receiving on the first Pentecost following the resurrection of Christ which marks the beginning of the Lord's church. And it is via that sword of the Spirit, the gospel, the faith, the word of God, the seed of the kingdom, that Christ is taught and Christ is magnified. 
It's the gospel of Christ. The Holy Spirit inspired men who delivered the gospel. Whose gospel? Whose glad tidings? Of Christ. And that's God's power to save us, Romans 1.16. In other words, God's located His power to forgive sins, to save us from our sins in the gospel message. But in all the revelation and confirmation of that word of God, the Holy Spirit never acted in self-interest. I've always found that to be interesting. He came not to please men, but to serve man in presenting God's terms of pardon as it was given him by Christ. His primary concern was to please the Father in the whole divine scheme of the salvation of mankind. Our next point has to do with the apostles of Jesus Christ that they did not please themselves. I may pause here and say you'll notice if you'll in general read through the New Testament letters to individuals and churches that they were constantly to one extent or the other and in one way or the other dealing with churches about not pleasing themselves. One of the big problems in the church at Corinth, although there were a multiplicity of different uh, matters in which they were mistaken on, but all it came back down to pleasing self. There's the rudimentary part of the whole thing. Paul's a good example of the unselfishness of the apostles of the Lord. Notice what he said. Even as I please all men and all things. And here's what he meant. Not seeking mine own profit. But the profit of many. To what end? That they may be saved. 1 Corinthians 10, 33. Wouldn't it be wonderful... Wouldn't it be marvelous? Wouldn't it be a thing of joy if every member of the Lord's church could make that statement honestly? Paul wasn't pleasing all men that he might become popular or that everybody would like him. Rather, he states the very plain reason for his conduct that they may be saved. 1 Corinthians 9, verse 19, For though I be free from all men, yet have I made myself a servant unto all. Now, why, Paul? Why? Here's what he said. That I might gain the more. Does that sound like that he was somebody who was always striving to study the Word of God with somebody to preach the truth, to teach it so that people could be saved? Every opportunity... Everything to him was, is this an opening for me to teach the gospel? A lot of us, if we had been with him in Athens as he waited for Timothy and others to come to him, we would have been seeing the sights. Well, of course, all over the Roman world at that time, it was about the same sight everywhere you looked. And Paul had grown up with those sights, and they weren't very pleasant. But as he walked around, you can see this desire to find an opening an opportunity to teach. And so he saw an altar that they had erected to the unknown God. And the pagan mind, that's only natural because we want to give homage to all those we know, but there might be one we don't know in this pantheon of Marvel comets. <laughs> that's about the way they thought of their gods. And so he said, well, here's a good place to begin. And so he begins his sermon that I beheld your altar of the unknown God and you who ignorantly worship him, I will now declare him unto you. And thus, you see how easy it is to find a platform when you're looking for it? When that's what's on your mind, saving souls, and wouldn't that be the way it should be about every member of the Lord's church? Further, he said, I made all things to all men that I might by all means save some. And this I do for the gospel's sake, that I might be partaker thereof with you. 1 Corinthians 9, 22-23. Now, it's very interesting to me if you've noticed these last quotes. They all came from what he wrote to the church at Corinth. I wonder why he keeps saying to the church at Corinth, everything I've done in my work as an apostle and preacher of the gospel, as living the Christian life, has been to help somebody else. Because what was the big, big, big problem in Corinth? 
Remember, in their misuse and abuse of miraculous gifts, they were saying that the gift of speaking foreign languages is greater than any other gift. What does that say about their attitude? If, that, if nothing else, what does that say about a skewed attitude? But Paul, in campaigning for lost souls, could say this, and I will very gladly spend and be spent for you. 2 Corinthians 12, 15. You know, sometimes we'll say something uh, jokingly about something. This came from the old, it still aired some places, uh, old Hee Haw series. And somebody would come up and say something about, well, did you hear about old Uncle Joe? He got his leg broke in two places. And the comment would be, well, he ought to stay out of those places. Well, those are kind of things like sometimes when we get ourselves in trouble for teaching the truth, standing for the truth, opposing error, dealing with people who are opposing themselves. And Paul even used that terminology. You, you get kind of broke up in different places. But why do you keep going back for more? And I have to ask the question, why did Paul keep going back for more? Why did the people in Jerusalem when the persecution was so hot and heavy after the death of Stephen that everybody but the apostles ran from Jerusalem to get away from it? But have you ever noticed, this is not by accident. They went everywhere preaching the word. Well, you dumbbells, that's what got you in trouble in the first place in Jerusalem. Why don't you shut up? Why don't you be quiet? Stay out of those places. Well, Paul tells us, I will very gladly spend and be spent for you. The work of the apostles did not make them popular with the world. And Paul portrayed his own plight as an apostle in these words. Even under this present hour, we hunger and thirst and are naked and are buffeted. And have no certain dwelling place. And labor, working with our own hands. Being reviled, we bless. Being persecuted, we suffer it. Being defamed, we entreat. We are made the filth of the world. And are the offscouring of all things unto this day. That's the kind of life of faithful Christians that made the difference in bringing down the whole Roman Empire and their paganism and immorality. They couldn't figure this out. Sometimes I think, and that's 1 Corinthians 4.13, sometimes I think we see the Roman world and we think of them as a lot of denominationalists. They're just messed up on Christianity. But that's not so. They, you should read some books on the state of the pagan mind and how they viewed themselves, everybody else, and the whole world. They had no background at all in anything we know of the Bible. It wasn't there. Or you said, what about the Jews? But they were a very small group of people. And many of them didn't accept the Christ or the gospel. They would band together with pagans sometimes or they would instigate the pagans, persecute the apostles and others. They just didn't have a con... You know, they had no concept of faith. They had no concept of faith. They didn't approach their gods in faith. They didn't have anything like that. They had no concept of the worth of life. Really, it was a matter to them of we please ourselves. And thus, and Paul quotes them, comes the idea that was regularly circulated, eat, Drink and be merry, for tomorrow we die. And Paul uses that by saying, that's not us. That's not the Christian. The apostles were not self-seeking, pleasers of men. Galatians 1.10, he said to those brethren, or do I now persuade men or God? Or do I seek to please men? For if I yet please men, I should not be the servant of Christ. Now, here's a good example in view of our noticing things earlier to where please is used in different senses. Earlier, we pointed out that Paul said, even as I please all men in all things, not seeking my own profit. Now, this has to do with the rule of right and dividing the word of truth. Are you going to say he's using the word please here in the same way both times? Well, certainly he's not. 
In one place he's saying, I'm doing God's will regardless of what happens to me because I'm seeking the salvation of others. So I don't do that to please me. In the other case he's saying, I don't seek to please men by compromising the truth so they won't hurt me. That helps to write and write the the word of truth to see the same word and how to use different ways. The apostles served all men. But of course they did that in primarily serving God and as he directed them to be dealing with all men. Then too, the child of God, any member of the Lord's church, can't please self. So many problems in the church, so many problems in individual lives, so many problems in families would be alleviated or at least to a great extent helped if people would learn that rule. Our text states that we should not act to please ourselves, but to please others. As Paul also wrote, let no man seek his own, but every man another's wealth. 1 Corinthians 10, 24. Well, I can think of some people you could use this in a different sense that uh, they do that. They seek another's wealth, but that's called a thief. That's not what he's talking about. He's talking about the well-being of others, the salvation of others, the spiritual strengthening of others. Now, to see how this kind of thinking fits the disciple of Christ, notice what he said to the Philippians, in Philippians 2 and verse, verses 4 and 5. And this really gets down to a lot of the problems we have why we can't excel in living godly lives. Look, not every man on his own things. I think, let that sink in for a minute. Look, not every man on his own things. But every man also on the things of others. Now, from what standpoint? In what sense? From what perspective? What my life does for others. Am I willing to compromise the truth to keep your friendship? Am I willing to be silent if it'll keep problems off of me? That seems to be the attitude of great many people, even in the church. But he said, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, Philippians 2, 4 through 5. And as I understand it, this is the theme of this year's lectures in England. Well, that's the kind of thing you can preach anywhere in the world. <laughs> if you can speak every language on this earth, this is needed there. We are followers of Christ in unselfishness. Seeking to please oneself, we've already seen, ends up in one spiritual death. In Luke 17, 33, whosoever shall seek to save his life shall lose it. And whosoever shall lose his life in this world is going to preserve it. So thinking too selfishly of life destroys the true hope of life. As true disciples of Jesus Christ, then in being faithful, we're walking in the footsteps of Jesus. And again, as I quoted earlier, who went about doing good, Acts 10 and verse 38. Timothy was instructed to charge the rich in this world that they do good, that they be rich in good works, ready to distribute, willing to communicate, laying up in store for themselves a good foundation against the time to come that they may lay hold on eternal life. You see how that selfishness is not helping us lay hold on eternal life. 1 Timothy 6, 17-19. Then to another young preacher, Titus, Paul wrote, This is a faithful saying, And these things I will that thou affirm constantly. And so to every gospel preacher, Paul just spoke. That they which have believed in God might be careful to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable unto men. Titus 3.8 We hasten to say good works is the Bible to find good works because there are people who give a definition of good works that would be contrary to Christian conduct. Then in 1 Thessalonians 5.15 Saints are told, See that none render evil for evil unto any man, but ever follow that which is good, both among yourselves and to all men. 
our selfishness is shown even as our unselfishness is shown and that is by our conduct not only to the saints but unto everybody even though we must be primarily interested in the body of Christ our brothers and sisters in Christ such Paul had in mind when he wrote Galatians 6 10 as we therefore as we have therefore opportunity let us do good unto all men especially unto them who are of the household of faith as we bring the lesson to its close, all the while we are serving all men as we serve God according to His Word, which is faithfully. We must essentially be striving, of course, to serve the Father. Well, in everything we've noticed today, we have answered the question, who am I trying to please? And in an honest heart, Luke 8, 15, surely we can answer that. The person outside of Christ who would obey the gospel has had to answer that question. I've lived for self and to suit myself. Now I must serve Christ. Now I must live my life as the New Testament teaches. And I need to have my past sins that alienated me from Christ remitted, forgiven, washed away by the blood of Christ. It's clear I can't go back to the cross and stand under that cross and have the actual blood of Christ fall upon me. Enter into the tomb and have the stone rolled in front of it. Then early on the coming first day of the week, when it's rolled back, go out of that tomb with Christ as he was resurrected. He can't do that. Impossibility. But I can obey a form of doctrine, a form of teaching of the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ having believed in him, repented of my sins, and confessed my faith in him, I can do that. And that's what Paul said, the brethren at Rome had done. But God be thanked that you were the servants of sin, but you've obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine. Being then made free from sin, you became the servants of righteousness, a new creature in Christ. And that form of doctrine is described earlier in Romans chapter 6 of being buried with Christ in baptism and raised to walk in years of life. You're saved to please your God and all that involves pleasing God, which covers caring for others as the Bible defines that care. As a child of God, have you ceased pleasing God and thus ceased pleasing others and seeking their soul salvation, your brothers and sisters in Christ and those outside of Christ. You can repent of those sins, confess them and pray God for forgiveness and rise up to walk again the straight and narrow way. Surely this lesson to those who are faithful in Christ will encourage us all to press on, to be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. For as much as we know our Labor is not in vain. It's not pointless or useless. Notice where? In the Lord. 1 Corinthians 15, 58. And to get into the Lord, one must be baptized into Christ. Galatians 3 and verse 27. So if you're subject to the blessed invitation of our Lord, it's still extended. Someday you know it's going to be withdrawn. I don't think we think about that much. But someday it's going to be withdrawn at the end of the world. I have no doubt where on the day of judgment there will be people screaming and yelling and begging for the mercy and favor of God. It won't be there anymore. No more invitation song. No more pleading with people to obey what they already know in their mind they ought to obey. It will all be over forever. Only those in this life who have humbled themselves and received with meekness the engrafted word and obedience to the great gospel of Christ will stand before their judge on that day having lived faithful lives and here, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter ye into the joys of thy Lord. So if you're subject to the blessed invitation of our Lord, we invite you to come while we stand and sing.